In this, I suppose, rather long lecture, we're going to have a look at pathfinding, uh, which uh, is a class of algorithms that will enable us to, to plan a route, or at least to, to determine a route from a start point until some uh, target destination point. Um, we'll, we'll look at some basic approaches, uh, all the way up to more complex approaches, which, if there is a path, no matter how tortuous, will eventually find that particular um, approach. So pathfinding, it's quite useful, not within all games, uh, but within any games where we want to have an AI-controlled character make its way across some environment, from a start point to, to a target destination point. And we want it to plan out a route and a journey that it's going to, to take, and ideally for that to be efficient, uh, in, in terms of, of, of sort of getting there quickly, as quickly as possible, potentially for it to look naturalistic in terms of believable to a person, and, and, and things along those particular uh, lines. So, it's defined, uh, pathfinding is a process of finding a path from a specified source to a specified target position, nothing more than that. To do this, we are making an assumption that we are moving about within a particular world, and that world has some representation. Or in essence, there is a walkable surface, and that walkable surface has some representation that we can then travel along. There's three common ways that this can be done within games. Uh, they are grids, waypoint graphs, uh, and then a, a navigational mesh. Um, so the navigational mesh is a bit more 3D related, but we'll have a look at the other two. In essence, we're going to assume most of the algorithms here were using a grid-based representation. Although, to a large degree, the algorithms don't depend upon the underlying implementation. They will work across all of these different types of, uh, of implemented uh, of form. Um, in terms of the path that we return from our pathfinding algorithm, it, it generally would be a set of instructions of go from this point to that point or on to this point next of all. Uh, so it, it is a path that needs to be followed. It typically isn't concerned with small obstacles or other moving obstacles on that. So even though we, are, we have a path from our destination point to our end point, we'll still want to potentially use some of our steering behaviours to evade other objects or to make sure we don't collide into to entities along that particular path. But grids is uh, our based, or our first uh, form of representation, tile-based representation. In this one here, we assume that the level is divided up into a number of equally sized cells. Uh, now, it could be hexagonally uh, arranged, uh, or the ones that are shown here are sort of uh, square-based. Um, and each tile, or each grid element, is connected to ones around it. So we can move to the north, the south, the west, and the east to transition around. If we have this form of representation, then certain cells will be passable, other ones will be impassable, and that will determine how we can move around within that environment. Uh, we can also be a little bit more fancy. We can give certain movement costs to a cell. We can say just how much time and effort needs to be expended to move through that cell uh, to, do, to model, for example, different types of terrain. Advantages of um, grid-based lookup um, it's, it's fast, it's very fast to, to work out your location. It's easy to sort of check the, the tiles or the, the squares around you in terms of asking, is, can I move to the north, the south, the east and the west? So it's quick and fast lookup. And it's what's known as the complete representation of the level. Uh, that if we have a level, we can chop it up into these uh, grids or into a grid. And that will provide a cell within the grid for every single bit of the level. So we're not missing out bits of the level. But you can do a compare and contrast map with, for example, with the navigation mesh, which we'll look at next. So as, as mentioned, grids is what we're going to assume. Another way we can use is a waypoint graph. So if you look at the, the image here, we um, have a, we want a sort of a yellowy color. Um, but we have a, an irregular environment set out with a number of, of rooms or doors or connectors between it. And we have defined a number of, of circles. These are our waypoints. And the waypoints are connected to other waypoints. And if we want to move from a waypoint to another connector, when we move in a straight line to it. So for example, if uh, we want it to move to the position that's labeled X at the near the top left-hand side of the diagram, and we were currently 
uh, car out of this just off position A, down towards the, the bottom middle, then what we would do is we'd move to our closest waypoint, which would be point A, and when we're on that then we would move in a straight line through a series of connected waypoints until we get to waypoint B, which is the one closest to our target destination, then we move to our target uh, destination. So advantages, so in this sense we can connect uh, a waypoint up to any number of other waypoints if there's a, a straight line transition between it. We can use this to represent quite complex topologies or arrangements. Um, they're also particularly good for games where you have restricted movement. And this is why we've got an example here of Pac-Man. So the easiest way to represent Pac-Man wouldn't be as a grid-based representation. You could, but it's probably better to represent it as a set of waypoints. Uh, where at each of the, the connecting uh, corridors you have a waypoint and you move in a straight line from one waypoint uh, to another one. There you have quite a flexible range of levels you could create, uh, for example, for Pac-Man. Other advantages, you can incorporate uh, other information, for example, like a ladder. You can have a waypoint for the bottom of the ladder, another for the top of the ladder, and that gives you a way of transitioning around potentially complex 3D environments. Uh, the side at the bottom typically provides an incomplete representation of the level. So waypoints are points within the game and you assume you can move in a straight line. There will be other ones, as you can see here, the character had to, in, in the yellow diagram, had to move to the closest waypoint and the target point X was actually off the waypoint. So it assumes that when we get to the closest one we can kind of move straight to our target point. So it's an incomplete representation. Probably all things considered, what is the best, the most flexible way is using a navigation mesh, but it's also probably the most complex way as well. So in this one here, we are defining what's known as a convex polygon triangle, is, is generally what they use. So um, um, a shape, but there's no sticky end bit, it's convex, so they're, they're, you know, the, the boundaries of it define the walkable surface um, of that. We can build then up a if, if you like, a mesh that represents the surface on what we can actually walk. And depending on how those mesh elements, the triangles, for example, are connected together, that can determine how we'll walk through um, that particular environment. Now, the advantage of using convex, as was the concave uh, shapes here, is that if you are on a convex shape uh, at a certain point on it, uh, and you want to move to any other point on that convex shape, is a straight line motion. You're just moving a straight line straight to it. That's not the case if it's concave. There you may have to leave the shape to get and then re-enter it to get to a point on it. Uh, so navigation mesh, you can think of it as like a walkable surface, lends itself both to 2D and to 3D games and it gives you a complete representation of the walkable surface where you're allowed to walk uh, within that particular game. Um, lots of advantages. One of the, the sort of other advantages is you can actually use it for collision detection as well. In as far as it defines a walkable surface, that is also the surface you want to constrain your characters to so they can't leave that. So again, it gives you a, a bit of collision um, um, detection prevention around that. But we're not going to assume use of navigation meshes, we're going to assume use of grids within this because they're probably the most straightforward one to use. So. Assuming then we have our world defined in some particular way, and as mentioned, we'll use a grid as our base assumption. We want to look now at a number of different algorithms that we can use to get us from a starting point to destination point. And we'll start off with some very simple, very crude ones, and work our way up to what is currently um, sort of routinely used within games nowadays, known as the A-star algorithm. So pathfinding algorithms, uh, we will they, they will output then um, a list of cells or points or nodes that we have to then visit one after the other which take us from a source to a destination. The goal of the algorithm then is to provide that particular list of instructions that we have to, uh, to, to, to follow along. Um, by way of a bit of terminology, if we have an algorithm that will find a path if a path exists. So, so in other words, you could present an impossible situation where it's not, you can't get to your end point. But if there is a way of getting to it, and it doesn't matter how torturous that way is, if it exists and the algorithm is guaranteed to find it eventually, it is known as a complete algorithm. It will find a path if a path exists. Uh, 
If we're thinking about the different algorithms here and trying to compare and contrast and to say if one's good or one's bad, the two key metrics that we'll use, you can see down at the bottom, is the quality of the path. So that can be in terms of the actual distance. Uh, is, it, is it actually the shortest path? Or is it a path that looks natural, similar to what a person might take? And also then the amount of um, resource, the amount of computation, the amount of memory that we need it to consume effectively to produce that path. So quality of the path and time and effort required. Or these are the two ways we'll, we'll make judgments, if you like, on the different algorithms we'll consider. Now, let's uh, start off with the most basic form of, of not really, I think it's, you couldn't really call this pathfinding, but this is the most basic form of getting from point A to point B, seeking, with a little bit of random obstacle avoidance. Uh, so we'll use a seek approach. Uh, so whilst the goal is not reach, if we look at the sort of the pseudocode in the yellow uh, square, we will seek towards it, move straight towards it. If there is something in our way for blocked, then we'll we'll move to right or to the left, whatever. We'll just try to step around it. Uh, so a very very simple approach. Head straight to it. If you're blocked with something, randomly move to the left or to the right. There you go. Too crude, and for a lot of environments it is too crude, but actually not always uh, uh, unnecessarily un un crude. So if you look at the example of the, the green uh, diagram shown here, we have largely an open environment that has a number of, for example, trees within it. And for that type of open environment, that algorithm would actually work perfectly fine. You would go through, if you hit something, you'd move to the side and you would then be past it. So it's good within sparsely or densely populated environments where mostly it's open. We can do a little bit of extension to it, so seek an obstacle tracing. So in this sense, whilst our goal isn't reached, we're moving directly towards it. If we are blocked with something, then we're not just going to randomly try to move to the left or to the right. We will then trace out around that obstacle and we'll, we'll keep moving around until hopefully we get past it and we can then seek towards our target. So an example here, going up to a wall, we'll go to the left hand side, we'll walk around the wall, then we'll head to to our net goal. So it, it, it works well. Again, it works well within largely open environments, uh, even if you have sizable objects within it. If you look at the example on, on the sort of the top right, you know, it, it gets around it, it'll find the target, but it's not, it's not an ideal path because a, a person doing this is unlikely to head straight up until they're basically hitting the, the, the face of the, the obstruction before walking around. They'll see it ahead of themselves and they'll then swerve around as part of their uh, walking towards it. So it's, it's good, it'll get you there, but we can improve upon it. Uh, give you a few examples of, of how these algorithms might be good or might be bad. So as we already mentioned, for largely for an open environment, they seem to work well. Uh, but for more closed environments, they may fail. Uh, if we're moving randomly to the left or the right, we could be stuck there for a long time. If we're tracing around something, depending on which way we trace, we either could get an okay path or we could get a path that looks very silly to the player in terms of an unnecessary amount of, of tracing. So they don't lend themselves really to closed indoor environments. Uh, just a little aside in terms of a breadcrumb trace, uh, so this is another approach where as a character walks through the level, you actually can have one which uh, sort of lays down a breadcrumb, a series of invisible points, but an AI entity could actually pick up on that breadcrumb trace and then follow it through to follow from one point to the next by way of tracking out or following um, the player or some other entity. And you can use things like that as, as other ways of, of, um, of, of moving around within an environment. So let's have a look at a few more complex algorithms that will try to produce better quality paths. All of the previous ones, they are okay in open environments, but they don't necessarily produce sensible or good paths within closed, like for example, indoor environments. Uh, so we're going to have to look at approaches that use more computational resource, CPU time and memory, to find a better quality path. Uh, for all of these ones here, I mean, we're going to start, we'll look at four, we'll look at uh, breadth first search, then a best first search, then what's known as the Dijkstra search, and then finally we'll move on to A star, which is the de facto standard within uh, games nowadays for finding paths. 
for all of these algorithms, they're going to share a few things in common. They will have an open list and a closed list. The open list contains a list of, of, of locations that we haven't yet visited, but we could potentially visit. So these, on this here, it basically it holds our list of our next steps, the next available steps that we can have within our search space. Um, ideally, we want to pick one of them that will get us closest to the target. The closed list, in turn, will hold the list of locations, cells, waypoints, whatever it's going to be, that we already have considered as part of the search. So these are ones we have visited, we've considered, we've looked at, and we've made some decision on. And as the thing, as the algorithms run, initially our open list will grow. We'll be adding things to it as we detect more ways of moving around the environment. And our closed list will also grow as well as we go through the search space, considering more and more spaces. Eventually we'll get to our target goal at the end, and then we'll then sort of backtrack through this by way of working out, okay, well, how do we get from our target point all the way back to the source? That's the path we want to follow. Uh, so I'll give you an example of the, the common structure here. We've got a grid-based approach, you can see. We've got a start node, we've got an end node, and we have our open and our closed list. Initially, both of them are, are blank, or empty at the minute. So what we will do is we'll, we'll create our start point. Uh, we're going to start from our current location, and we'll push that onto our open list. So our start point, 2.4, gets pushed onto the open list. We'll then um, repeat whilst the open list isn't empty. Now, if ever we get to a situation where the open list is empty, it means that we've exhausted all of our possible next steps. And if we haven't yet reached the target, it means that we haven't found a path to the target. And basically at that point, we, we have to give up. Uh, so whilst the open list isn't empty, in this case, we do have a point two four on it. We're going to pop that out of the open list. So it's removed from the open list. And that becomes our current node, the current location we are considering. Now, if we found our goal node, so our, our, we've taken something off the closed list and it happens to be where we want to go to, then we find our goal and we can just backtrack by way of getting out the path it took us there. If that isn't the case, it means we haven't yet got to our destination, so we're in the process of finding our way there. We're going to say for the current node that we're at, where might we be able to step? Where can we go from there? And in the case of an open grid where there's no obstacles, we can move to the north, the south, the west, the east, the northwest, the southeast, and so on. So we're adding in all of the possible steps that we can take from our current uh, goal. And we're going to push them onto the, the open list. Um, having done that, we'll then take our current node and we'll push that onto the closed list. So you can see now for open list and our closed list, they've been updated. On the closed list, we have 2.4. So this is the point we have considered. We've processed it and we're done with it. In the open list, we have 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, 3, and so on. So these are all of the, the, the locations where I could transition, transition to from 2.4. Uh, and we repeat it. So now we've got in our while loop. Uh, whilst our open list isn't empty, we now have eight um, items on our open list. We're going to pick one of them. Um, we'll repeat the process of saying for the one that we pick, where can we go to from this one? We'll add those points onto our open list and we'll add the current load, the new current load, onto our closed list. And that'll repeat until either we find our target or we run out of steps. We can't consider any more points and we have to give up at that point. Key questions uh, for all of these things is that if you have several nodes in your open list, as you do here, which node should you take from it? one at random, or should you select one according to some criteria? And uh, when you're creating new nodes, what nodes do you create? What successor nodes? And generally speaking, they'll all have the same answer to this. It'll be nodes that are not currently on the open list and ones you could visit, potentially visit from your new current location. So let's have a look at some algorithms. We'll use a breadth first search as our initial one, just to get the ball rolling. So this will find a path from the start to the goal by uh, using a ply by ply, expanding out layer by layer by layer until we reach our target location. Key questions, which node has popped? The node's been waiting the longest. So whatever one was is longest, like a you know, stack-based structure, first in, uh, first out. Um, which uh, node are we going to add in? Every single one we don't have on our open list, which you haven't yet visited. So there's an example. 
we're going to go from our start node to our destination end node. Uh, the black uh, cells we're assuming are impassable. They represent a wall which we cannot uh, move through. We have to move around. So initially, we start off uh, at our start location and we'll add into that all of the darker green ones. So there's seven locations that we can move to and there's one that's blocked so we don't add that in. Now, we have all seven. They've all been added at the same time. So we've got to just pick one of them at random because they've all been waiting the same time. So let's assume that we pick the top uh, left-hand node. We'll add the two locations we can go to that into it. The rest of them we already have in the open list. We don't need to do that. Now we go back. We, we'll have then a total of, of um, what six other points that were added all at the same time. We're going to pick one of those and we'll add in that. And again, the, the, the middle three, or the start to the left and to the right, we'll consider those next, but we can't go anywhere. Then we're into the bottom three, and we'll add in the different values that they can go as well. Now, at that point, the initial um, seven values that we added in, we've considered all of them. So we are back to our condition of asking which one has been waiting the longest, and that's the one on the top left-hand side. So we would take that out and add on the two values to that. And then we're repeating the process. So you can sort of see how it builds up. Uh, and over time, then, we will expand out and out and out and out. So it is apply by apply and expanding search until eventually we reach to our target goal. Uh, at that point, we'll stop. We'll say we found it and we can backtrack through the thing. So it's an exhaustive search. Uh, so it's systematic, but it's not clever. It just does a big brunt uh, sort of search force. Uh, depend, it is likely, certainly in comparison to other techniques, to use a considerable amount of CPU and memory in this expensive search. It's guaranteed to find the path that has the fewest number of nodes. That's not to say the, the path that has the shortest distance, um, because, for example, the, the traveling through a node, you may have different costs or maybe different distances associated with it, but it'll find the path with the shortest, smallest number of nodes. It's a complete algorithm. If there is a path to the destination, it'll find it eventually. So it's, it's a starter for 10, not a great one, but let's see how we can improve upon it. Next one we'll look at is a breadth, or sorry, best first search. So in this case, uh, which node do we pick? Well, the one that is closest to the goal, and again, we're adding on the same types of uh, nodes onto our open list each term. So here we're using problem-specific knowledge. We're not just looking at the, the, the cells and picking one of them. We're asking the cells to do some type of evaluation on them. In this case, to work out how far each cell is away, how far we think it is away uh, from our target node. So we're going to compute the distance. Uh, we'll assume straight line distance, Euclidean distance. Uh, so that uses a heuristic cost. So we're going to have a guess at how far away we think the thing is. Now, we don't know it. We're just going to assume it's a straight line. If we were to go in a straight line, how far is that thing away? There may be a wall in the way. We're not going to know that quite yet. So we're going to have a guess. It's known as a heuristic. It's a, um, a, a rule of thumb, a guess as to how far we believe the thing is away. And that's what we we'll use to select our path. So let's give you an example then. So which node has popped? Uh, popped? The node that has, is closest to the goal using Euclidean straight line distance. So here we have an example, we've got our start and we've got our end node. Now, out of the, um, the seven darker green cells that we pushed on to our open list, one of them, the one that's now highlighted in yellow, is the one that is closest to our end node if we use straight line distance. So we would consider that first of all, but then we would realize that, oh, there's four impassable cells around this, and the other three ones I can move to, or the four ones I can move to, are, I've already considered. So then we go on to the next one, but the closest, that's the second one that's been highlighted here in yellow. Uh, so we're picking that one. Uh, that'll be then added onto the closed list, and the different green colored ones will be in our open list. We'll look at those, and we'll, again, we'll pick the one that is closest to it, pop it on, one that's closest to it, one that's closest to it, so on and so forth. So we'll get there more or less um, fairly, fairly quickly, fairly directly. So on average, users much fewer resources than the breadth first search. Generally speaking, tends to find reasonably acceptable paths. It's a complete algorithm in that if there is a path to the target point, you'll find it eventually. But it's not without its limitations. So I'll give you a few examples of where 
it doesn't work as well. So if you look at the example over on the right hand side uh, initially, uh, in this case we moved straight towards it and then we, we traced our way around it. The actual closest path would be if I had stepped to the left and you can see sort of an extreme example of this in the image over on the right where I'm going to my target node, my purple node from my sort of red node, but I head into the corner of the room and then I realize, oh no, I'm all blocked. So I then have to backtrack out of the room and then to head back down to it. So it's not, it's not ideal um, necessarily in terms of, of always finding the optimal uh, path. Now, how can we improve upon this? Uh, we're going to look at Dijkstra search. Now, it's, I'm not producing a better path here. Dijkstra is going to be similar to the, the, the breadth first approach, but will add in an important element that we'll then build upon. So in this sense, we're not worried about the distance to the goal. Instead, we are going to track the cost of every single path that we're developing. So this, this will be one that will build up a path cost. And we'll use the actual cost of the path. The path with the current lowest cost is the one that we will select. So it will be similar to breadth first with a little bit of additional uh, complexity in terms of a path cost. So we'll see um, how this works here. So which node is popped? The node attached to the path of the lowest overall cost. And we can see it. Um, so we have our usual diagram. We will initially take out uh, our path costs. So they're all cost of one. So we want to pick any of the ones. We'll do that. We'll get twos. Go through still processing the ones. Eventually then we'll end up with path costs of twos. We'll pick one of the twos. So twos will give us threes. Uh, then we'll go through the threes, we'll pick up the threes, they'll give us fours, uh, fours will turn into fives. Um, we'll pick them the fives, and at that point we'll find our, our target point at the end. So for this particular um, approach, oops, I'll go back. It's an exhaustive search, so it is one that will find a path if a path exists. It's at least as resource intensive as breadth first, because you're recording the path, it can actually be more resource intensive always finds the optimal path because here in terms of the actual cost I, I know I was just counting from one to two to three to four here but if you have a movement cost associated with path that takes into things like the train cost there you can build that into the path cost uh, when you're building it up so it is guaranteed to find the optimal path based on whatever cost you have defined for moving from one cell to another complete algorithm if there's a path it'll find it okay so all of those things now bring us on to A star. A star is, is the gold standard. It's what is used in, in games nowadays. And to do this here, we're going to combine two of the algorithms. We're going to combine best first with Dijkstra. And that will give us then two, uh, if you like, elements to the cost to a path. And you can see this down at the bottom. So this sort of represents a midpoint where we had our starting node and we've got our destination node and the yellow node is where we're currently at. So for the yellow node, we've got two elements. We've got a given cost, which is kind of the Dijkstra cost. It is the cost that we have incurred moving from the start to that point. And that's a known cost, it's accurate, because we've moved, we calculated what it actually would cost. We then will have a heuristic cost, which is the guess of how far or how much longer it will take us to get to our destination or end point. And here, in terms of the second red line pointing out to end, it's a straight line, it's a Euclidean distance, a straight line distance. So it is a guess. It may be right. In this case, it's going to be slightly off, a little bit wrong. So we're going to use combinations of things we like about Dijkstra, things we like about best first, combine them together to produce an improved algorithm. So which node is popped? The node that's attached to the path with the lowest cost. Now, the path cost you can see down at the bottom is equal to the given cost plus the heuristic cost, and we can weigh these things. So um, the given cost I always know, heuristic cost is going to be a guess. I can either say I'm going to put more or less emphasis on that given guess. So I, I can say, I can, I can balance them equally, I say each of them is worth 50% of the overall total, or I can say that I'm more interested in the given cost and more interested in the heuristic cost. Um, so again, it's just very uh, things you can vary for the algorithm. Uh, the actual algorithm itself then, so let's have a, a look at how it runs. So there we've got our start, there we've got our end. We're going to push on uh, the initial set of values. 
So for example, there we see we've got a seven, a six, and a five being added on to it. So if you look, for example, at the seven in the top left, this assumes that we have a cost of one moving from the start to that cell, and then a cost of, if you count across, one, two, three, four, five, six, moving straight towards the end. Uh, so for that, that it has its cost of seven, a movement of one to get to it, plus then an estimated cost of six to move straight to the end. If you have a look at one of our fives, um, so there we, we, we had a cost step of one to get to it, plus in terms of the straight line distance, we're assuming one, two, three, four uh, steps will bring us to our destination. Now, we calculate those things in terms of the given plus the heuristic straight line cost, add them on. We're going to pick then the path with the lowest cost. That's going to be one of the fives. Uh, so we initially will we'll pick one of the fives. Okay, one of the fives won't give us any choice. The second five then, we will actually be able to add three new items onto our open list. We add those items on, we'll have a seven, a six, and a five. So that represents, in this case, a, um, a given cost of two. So we have to go from the start position down to the first five and then onto it, plus then our, our heuristic or our straight line cost. So the best guess we have at the minute is still five. So that's um, down in the, the sort of the bottom middle. So it was a step distance of two to get to there, plus one, two, three, going in a straight line towards the end, except that the one, two, three towards the end, two of the squares are blocked, but we don't yet know that because our heuristic is a guess. Uh, okay, again, five is still the lowest, we'll pick that. If we do that, our five turns into a six. So in this case, the, the six down at the bottom middle, it was a total of one, two, three to get there. Plus, in terms of our straight line cost, one, two, three to get to the end. Now, we've got two sixes. We might as well pick one of them. I had to pick one of them. Let's assume we pick the one down at the bottom. So in this case, we have a cost of seven. It's increased. So this represents going from the start. We had to do one, two, three, four to get there, plus one, two, three. Still, we're guessing three in terms of our straight line distance. So that seven means that it's now not optimal. We have a six just above the start square. So we go and look at that six, we add on the values for that, and that six gives us a six cost as well. So one to get to it and five to get to the end. Uh, if we progress that along, here we have again another six, it takes two to get to it, or one, two, three to get to it, plus one, two, three to the end. And that will actually filter through until we reach our target point at the end. So in this sense, it's, is built it up in terms of actual cost and a guest cost. And we always pick the one that looks most promising based on that. And if we do make a bad decision, ultimately that will increase the path cost, the overall cost. So then we'll, we'll go back to using one that has a lower, more promising value. So it's quite a nice algorithm. Um, in general for these things, it averages and uses much less uh, than the Dijkstra or the breadth first search. Uh, if, if you have a an admissible heuristic, uh, I'll talk about that in a second, uh, you are guaranteed to find the optimal path. And the key thing to know is that straight line distance, making an assumption you're going a straight line is a humis an admissible heuristic. It will always find the optimal, the best path in that particular case. It's a complete algorithm. If there's a solution, you'll find the way there. So one of the things we can say, I mean, I'll, I'll go through this algorithm very quickly because if you wanted to implement it, you can just have a look at this particular slide. Uh, so we create the start node, push it onto the open list, fair enough. Whilst the open list isn't empty, fair enough. Pop the node with the lowest cost, okay. If it's the end node, then we find it, so so much the same. Now, for every node that's connected to it, this is where I suppose the A star bit comes in. We want to create the successor node that was given a combination of the given cost plus our straight our heuristic cost. In this case, we're using straight line distance. Now, we've got a little check here, and this is this is was one thing's a little bit different about A star. If the successor node has been visited before, uh, and if the successor node has a lower cost than the current stored node, so what this represents is that. If we find, um, so we, basically it, it, it entails that we have found two different paths to the same point. So there's two ways of getting to some the same point in our search space. If that is the case, we want to store the path of the lower cost to that particular search point. Uh, so as we go through this and as we find new and improved ways of getting to points, then we'll update it with that new and improved way.
So if the successor node has been visited before, so it's a new one that we found, and if we find a lower cost to that node, then we update it to contain the lower cost because that makes sense if we find a better way of getting to that uh, node on the open list. Uh, other than that, uh, we will ignore it if it's already on our open list and it has the lowest cost. We don't have an improved way of getting there. We just simply ignore the thing. Uh, else, in terms of the usual thing, we'll add it onto the open list if it's a place we haven't encountered before and we'll push the current node onto the closed list and we'll go around. Once we get to the very end, we'll backtrack our way back through and that will give us our actual path that we're going to return. There are different types of heuristic that you can uh, use. Um, we have, have here an underestimating heuristic. So this is one that will that underestimates or, or underestimates, it gets it right either one, underestimates the distance. Uh, it's going to result in a larger search space it's going to be a little bit more pessimistic, um, but an algorithm or a heuristic that always underestimates or gets it right, and that is straight line distance. So if you assume you go in a straight line, either you're spot on or there's something in the way and you thought that it was going to take me five steps and actually it takes seven steps. So you've underestimated the cost. If you have that type of heuristic, you will get the optimal path. You're guaranteed of finding the best possible path. So straight line distance or other forms of underestimating heuristic will give you the best path. Uh, conversely, alongside that, you also have um, oh, we're back. Overestimating heuristics. So these are ones that will have a guess, and sometimes they will they 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 will you know it's going to be shorter than what they think. They think that the target's ten units away, but actually when you explore the path, it's only five units away. So an overrating heuristic is, is generally speaking one that will head straight towards the target. They'll, they'll, they'll favor going straight towards the target. Um, they'll find it if it's there, it'll still be complete. But in doing that and, and having less emphasis in terms of the given cost, they may not find the optimal cost. Uh, but generally speaking, they will use less uh, resource in terms of the search space. So I mean, it swings and roundabouts. Cleaning distance is the common one to use. It's an underestimating one. So you may have slightly large search spaces, but you'll get there uh, with the optimal path. So some extensions you can have to hierarchical, uh, to pathfinding. One is hierarchical pathfinding. And this is actually fairly similar to how, I suppose, we might do this, that if you're planning a a long journey, you might plan it at a high level first of all, uh, from going, for example, traveling through Europe from one country to another country to another country, the series of countries, and then you would break it down within that in terms of, well, how did you get across that particular country? So you can do a similar thing here where we might have an outdoor and an indoor environment. At the high level, we run our pathfinding in terms of, well, you move from this building, then you go to that building, and when we get within those buildings, then we may rerun or pathfinding again in terms of how we actually make our way through the buildings. Uh, so it gives you very flexible um, approaches. It means that you don't have to, to plan a very complex journey out initially. You can just do your high level planning and then kick the thing off for the first stage um, actually done. Things that make it difficult to do is that, uh, and this is where you can have overestimating heuristics. So if, I, if I'm traveling through a house uh, um, and I, 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 at my, my higher level, I'm saying, okay, I want to travel through this house. I've got to come up with an estimate of how long it th I think it will take me to travel through that house. So that's where um, you know, you're unlikely to be able to go in a straight line. So I may have some different metric, and that metric may over or underestimate the actual cost of going through. But, but there's lots of different ways you can um, um, sort of try to approach that. Other aspect we can do is we can add in train cost as well, that uh, if each cell isn't a movement cost of one, but we want to say that for some cells, depending on the entities that are moving, they will incur a different cost. Maybe it's, a, it's two movement points to move through some cells or three for others. Uh, you can build that into to, um, A star pathfinding quite easily because there you're, you're adding it into your given cost. And in terms of your estimated cost, you'll make some assumption about the average type of terrain you'll be moving over and then to use that to, for your, 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 your heuristic cost. Uh, so it does, it's an easy extension, but again, it'll give you a, a way of more intelligently moving about an environment. You can also use exactly the same approach for things like cover as well. 
So if you want to have a character that moves about in cover, you can put high cost in, in, in movement cells which are, which are lit, which are visible, which put the character in danger then of being seen. And you'll have a path being generated which will try to keep the character mostly in cover as they navigate their way around a level. Very, very flexible. Okay, so key takeaways in this one here is a fairly long lecture overall. Um, pathfinding algorithms, there's lots of different types from very simple seat-based ones with a bit of obstacle avoidance all the way up to, to A-star, which is the de facto standard. The base implementation of A-star is actually fairly straightforward, but there's lots of nice ways you can extend it then to put in uh, pathfinding that takes into account movement costs or terrain uh, availability or moves in a sort of a tactical or strategic manner as well. And it's certainly, um, if, if pathfinding is of interest, if you're in the new game, it's a good algorithm to, to implement and to get your head um, around. Mm -hmm.